Hello everyone, welcome to this Instagram live. I'm going to be joined today by my good friend Tristan. Hey everyone, welcome. Okay, Tristan's here. Cool. So, say hello. Let us know where you're calling from around the world. We will be recording this as well. So maybe I'll do it afterwards or tomorrow I'll upload this. It will also be on maybe on YouTube uh, because I have the hard file for it as well. But anyway, welcome Tristan. What's up, man? How's it going? I'm good, thank you. So it's a Sunday evening. We've got nothing yeah. better to do than have a conversation <laughs> talking about Bitcoin and beef. That's right. Yeah, we got the we're twinning too. The shades. It's nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I didn't want to be in black, in darkness, so um, the the light's not that bad here. But but we're all good. Um. So funny enough, we are actually speaking where the like you know next uh yeah uh where you done the ice bath. In yeah, Santa yeah, Teresa. yeah. I'm literally in the property next door to that. Funny enough. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. What was that like a year and three or four months ago? It's been, it's crazy. Something like that. <laughs> Something like that. But anyway, I mean, um, please give us a little bit of a background story, who you are, where you're doing it, and then just dive into like how you got into this health space. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm the author of a book called uh, Bitcoin and Beef, which uh, came out earlier this year. It talks about decentralization uh, in our food and monetary systems, how that's you know connected, how it's important to understand the nuances on, in these topics because they're highly technical. And, uh, you know, I put a lot of factual firepower in the book so that you can defend what you believe in. Uh, and convince others, your friends and family. So it's over 300 references. And yeah, it's it's nuanced, right? So like beef is not inherently bad, but there is better versions of beef and better ways to do ranching and, and agriculture. And Bitcoin has also gotten a bad name in the media, just as beef has for also being, you know, highly bad for the environment and um, not safe and yeah, not really... Um, well liked by the government entities that control our lives so that's the similarities but yeah it's it's been a great ride and have been growing the education since then but how did i get to to writing this so i was originally just getting really into health after i had one too many concussions in college so my brain was was really messed up had post concussive syndrome for you know 15 months about 4 years ago so i really just dove down the self-healing rabbit hole. And uh, yeah, after my neurologist didn't help me at all and, uh, you know, consumed all this good free education out there, podcasts, books, YouTube videos, and kind of just became obsessed with, with health and optimizing my health. And then, yeah, you, you learn about health and then you inherently learn about the food system, you know, what we're eating, how it's raised. So I got really into regenerative agriculture. Um, I started buying my meat, you know, I started you know, from the rancher directly. Um, the past three years have been doing that. It's been fantastic. And uh, yeah, um, my takeaway from that experience was like the biggest thing that sucked about having a concussion is like I went from being a college athlete to not being able to walk like around campus without being like dead tired just from doing that. So I just felt so limited. Like someone put me in a box of what I could do. So after I started feeling better, it's like, I just love being in control of my life. So I think that's what this is all about is taking back control at the individual level from, you know, these highly centralized <clears throat> corporations that are running our life. And it takes a bit of takes a bit of ownership and accountability and responsibility. But man, if you think long term, and, and you start taking actionable, you know, items every day, you can yeah. just be so much better off. 100%. Well, this is the whole thing about decentralized. And I use this term quite a lot, decentralized. With your thinking, with your whole life, basically. So you have the freedom financially, but health, your return of investment, which again, mm -hmm. you actually made a good point in the book, like revert, return on investment is, is key here. And again, like individual, I mean, uh, daily 
investments for your health, they're, they're not just in a now and a short term, they're going to provide dividends long term, not just for you, but for your family, for your friends, and f- like further generations and that. And obviously, you can see the disconnect with our agriculture industry or how our food supply, it's just completely just gone a narrow, a, a narrow short term thinking, like short term model, which again, is, is going to set us up to fail. And that's obviously what the book highlights. And even our article goes into that, that we, well, that you mostly done. Uh, and again, that's talking about soy depletion. It's talking about, I think it was, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but there's only like four companies in the US own 75% of all the cattle produced, which is insane. Yeah. yeah. That, that is like mind blowing. And again, if you put that out to like the whole world, I'm sure the figures would probably be, be about the same with everyone. Well, they're multinational companies is the problem. So people often get confused with like, yeah, international and national statistics, but it's actually the same companies. And yeah, you know, 75 to 80% of the grass fed beef that's sold in US supermarkets is imported from New Zealand, Australia, Uruguay, Argentina. And then we sell majority of our beef to China, Korea, um, Taiwan. And it's just like this, the global supply chain mess because of the insane profitization that needs to happen with these companies. And they're the ones pulling all the strings. Yeah. And then there's your poor little farmer down the end who's just getting literally manipulated in the UK. Like it's happening to the poultry, the egg industry. I don't know if you're following Mm. the news, but basically they're just getting obliviated via uh, the government throwing down conditions of like, uh, I don't even know what the virus is, but apparently they can't let the birds out. And then they're just just destroying them. Um, And again, there's no real safety concerns. uh, And again, like a farmer can still sell their eggs at a farmer's market, but they can't send them to a retailer in a supermarket. It's just, it's just mind blowing. Um, But I mean, in terms of like, let's lead with the article, like plant agriculture is innocent and they there's no blood on your hands if you're a vegetarian or a vegan like and again the the study that we used to i don't know to show that this was the case is a bit a bit gray as well so do you just oh, yeah. want to expand the study and what you would take the figures as or what you think the study study really shows yeah so you know just and and the article in itself like we we wrote this because you know there's there's been this massive momentum in the in the veganism space in the vegetarian space and uh it really started why because of this notion to not eat sentient beings to save beings and save animal lives which is you know a great thought in you know in the 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 laboratory bubble of um, ideal scenarios, right? It's, it's like, that's the ideal scenario. But in reality, that's not the case, because plant agriculture is actually um, also causing many deaths just indirectly, instead of directly, you know, because if you kill a cow, you kill a chicken, you eat it, that's easy to, you know, articulate that you're responsible for that death. But what you know this study by fisher and and lamy tried to do and they're super transparent like if you actually read the whole study which yeah. most people don't they're like hey guys like this is a best guess at yeah. best and there's so much variability between geography between crop, crop varieties and species yeah. but yeah they they tried to put some estimate that you know 7.3 billion animals are killed annually from plant agriculture in in the US And yeah, that's an alarming figure. And, you know, Chris Kresser mentioned this on the Joe Rogan podcast and just got absolutely like obliterated by by vegans. But it's not the point, you know, the point is not to argue, you know, number of death versus number of death. It's it's to take this notion that there is no diet free of death and that it totally is, you know, scenario and environment ecosystem dependent. But we know that monocrop plant agriculture is extremely detrimental to biodiversity, to life, and that this industrial farming system for plants is really resulting in a lot of death. And we can't even, 
you know, calculate this because what is a life, you know, is where does it stop? Does it stop at a gopher? Does it stop at a mouse? Does it stop at bugs yeah. or, or birds? So, yeah. <laughs> Who decides that? Like, I had like a, I had a vegan tweet me today about you know killing of sentient beings. If you eat a diet like that, you're just a hypocrite. I was like, man, like I just I should have just sent the article. <laughs> yeah, I just think it's just that people do live in like glass houses or in bubbles where they just don't see the the true impact on the choices that they make. And again, that's even for clothing. That's even mm -hmm. for like, energy, like using this oh, yeah. like right now. There's a, there's a biological cost to this. It's coming from some resource. Like, and again, it, it, it doesn't come from thin air. Or ideally, that would be the way that we, we utilize things because it's, it's there, but we don't. Um, and I mean, do you want to just shed some light on terms of like beef and a whole and why you think the, the message around, okay, beef is a problem or eating animals is a problem. And actually, the data suggests we're, we're eating far less than yeah than what's perceived well yeah beef specifically so i mean since you know the the beef consumption in the, in the u.s at least peaked in like the 70s and since then we're we're actually consuming like 25 to 30 percent less beef uh today than we were in the 70s and it's actually around the same as what we were consuming like the turn of this the century in, in the early 1900s but if you look at chicken it's like um, straight diagonal line of, of increasing amount and it's skyrocketed and it's this whole notion that somehow whoever's marketing chicken is like doing a fantastic job because it's like this white meat that like appears yeah. cleaner it's like oh there's not blood or it's not red so you don't have this deep of a connection that you're resulting in the death of an animal it almost looks you know like innocent and, and that's like fish is a similar way but also it's because scaling chicken in the industrial model is way easier you know but, you can... but i mean i would i would counter that and say beef is sort of similar to which we'll touch on in a minute but like beef to me is still a domesticated animal to a certain degree compared to like goats bison oh yeah but again i definitely agree like chick white i see chicken breast in the supermarket and i'm going like that just looks like tofu <laughs> I, I mean it, i'm sure but that's like, why people eat it because it does yeah. look like tofu. Yeah. Yeah. And again, most often it, it does taste like cardboard. There's no real flavor to it. And again, it's, it's obviously better than nothing. But, like, but again, it's this whole notion where you've got to eat lean, save the calories. But again, when we're, when we're thinking on decentralized uh, mindset, where we want to be thinking about money and the cost of living, but we also want to be thinking about nutrients. And to the bigger point about feeding, can we actually sustainably feed the, the world or the population in a regenerative agriculture? It would be actually to remove this notion about eating lean protein and actually fundamentally looking at the whole animal, the whole beast, if you want, and mm -hmm. like utilizing the fat. Because uh, again, that's going to be providing calories and it's going to be a cheaper cost than seeking lean protein because it's, it's going to be energy inefficient uh, on the cost factor. Does that yeah. make sense what I'm trying to say? No, yeah, hundred percent. But uh yeah, and, and it's like, you know, ruminants versus monogastric animals are, are totally different. If you want to talk about sustainability, like ruminants, goats, sheep, cattle, bison, lamb, uh, they can just live on the grass like one hundred percent and not need any external feed. And they do more for soil health, um, of course, and rotational grazing, uh, as opposed to chickens and pigs, they can eat some grass but they actually need to be supplemented with some sort of feed because, you know, in reality that they, they wouldn't be in such quantities to where in nature to where you could just leave them on their own. They need to have some external feed. And uh, yeah, we talk about in the article too, right? Like if you want to talk about a life is a life, you would want to eat the largest, the largest animal yeah. one being a cow or a bison probably compared to, um, you know, hundred chickens for that equivalent. So it all gets a little hairy there if you want to get into that space, right? Yeah, and, and I mean, I mean, I've never bought a a whole cow and put it in the freezer. Uh, I don't know what the word's called for that, but like, um, you've been doing that recently, haven't you? Whether it's a an yeah. elk or um, but yeah, how does yeah. how how does that work economically? Like doing that? 
Yeah, basically, I mean, I've bought a whole cow this past year and the previous two years, like a, a quarter or a half cow. So basically, all you, all you need is a, a chest freezer um, to be able to fit all the meat, which is one of the best investments I think you can make, especially with food security being an issue nowadays. Why is that? Because, you know, most of our meat's coming from overseas. And if they're on a cargo ship in L.A., they're not going to get to your grocery store in Nebraska, maybe. But either way, you need to invest up front. So you need to spend some money and have a lower time preference and also spend more. You know, it costs like, you know, a couple thousand dollars to buy a half cow or a whole cow, depending on the size. Um, but yeah, I connected with a local rancher in Wyoming who's 100 percent grass fed, grass finished. Um, and then you just pay and pick it up at the processor. You, you call the processor, tell them what cuts you want, you know, what size steaks, what type mm -hmm. of ground you want the organs. And I made sure to get all of the fat and all of the bones. Cause usually they keep that. But if you get the whole cow, you have a bit more sway in the negotiations. So I've made like, you know, a few pounds of beef tallow from all that fat, um, which now sells at the grocery store for $15 a jar. <laughs> And uh, I, you know, have all these bones to make bone broth with, or you know, bone marrow. So, yeah. yeah, that. And then, yeah, you mentioned the elk. That's you know, I've gotten into hunting this past year, which is probably I think the most admirable way to acquire your meat. People will disagree, but you know, I had to hike forty miles over a week and carry seventy plus pounds of of elk uh, with the help of one friend um, down a mountain a few few kilometers. 5k roughly to my car two trips you know it's this is like not for the faint of heart um but people that, do hunt in different ways that's a lot easier so yeah i mean that's that's true movement and uh physical activity not just going to the gym and driving to the shops to pick up your your chicken breast yep. or something like that um is there is there ways obviously not everyone can can get that initial investment into a chest freezer and buy a half or a quarter cow is there is there groups online where people can, I don't know, connect and say, hey, you're in this state or in this town? Like, is there is there things like this going on on the Internet? Yeah, I mean, how this kind of started is they're called like cow shares or, you know, lamb shares or pig shares because, you know, you're buying like a quarter of an animal per se. And, uh, you know, you're going in technically with three other people. Um, so yeah, I would just recommend, you know, going to your local, local farmer's market and, and talking to the, you know, the, the meat suppliers, they almost always, they love it when you buy in bulk because they can get rid of more. Um, and they have the animals accounted for by the time they're going to slaughter, as opposed to them slaughtering and then having to sell the piece meats, which is a whole issue with the, the meat supply chain is that, um, you, have a market access issue. So that's why we ship so much overseas because if you have a thousand cows, you need to get rid of who's buying them. You don't have a thousand cows worth of freezer space to sell all the cuts and all the steaks and you know, that has to go somewhere. Yeah. And I mean, changing sort of subjects a little bit now, like could you just summarize the, the greenhouse gases? Um, what what how like how do we make sense of that because everyone throws out that meat basically the sum of meat equates to is it 10 percent um to, to the global emissions now the reality is some people have countered that and said four percent what's your take on these, these sort of arguments and figures yeah i think it's it's definitely been overstated so you when you when you hear these like 10 12 15 percent emissions argument that's just completely false and um, if you look at the actual data from the EPA or, or from some international body, you know, um, animal livestock agriculture is like at most four or five percent. And then if you, you have to divide that up into, you know, what do you actually want to see? A lot of the emissions come from dairy, actually. So um, if you want to look at both dairy and beef, then yeah, maybe we're talking two, three percent at most. And I know there's probably updated figures, but yeah, you could say that that's a, a large percentage, two, three percent of all the emissions. Sure, that's it's something. But in reality, it's nothing compared to, you know, like the transportation or the energy industry where all these emissions are really coming from. So that's where I like to start that argument. And, you know, they've shown that, yeah, if you stop eating meat completely, like you're really only going to make like maybe like a half percent difference. And then, 
if you actually dive into the nitty gritty, pretty much not at all, because um, the emissions are in the form of carbon dioxide, CO2. So everything's calculated in equivalent CO2 emissions. Beef don't emit CO2, they emit methane, CH4, which then gets you know converted later in the natural carbon cycle into CO2. And um, it's part of this natural cycle, but they get penalized because methane is a much stronger um, gas um, energy wise because it's a totally different type of gas compared to CO2. Um, and rightfully so, it does absorb more energy in the atmosphere, but it has a totally different characteristic and, and lifespans compared to CO2. So really, um, you're talking about like a 10 to 15 year lifespan of methane compared to hundreds of years of lifespan of CO2. So if you had a if you had a ranch in Costa Rica and you had a hundred cattle there for 10 to 15 years, you never increased the size of your herd. You're really not uh, emitting any more additional um, emissions to the atmosphere. At that point, you've reached like a steady state. So that's where this also gets so convoluted. And yeah, I mean, Dr. Frank Mitloner, Diana Rogers, like these guys are doing fantastic work on, on educating there. But when you dive into it, you just can see that there's so many you know, holes to poke through this, this argument that climate change is responsible um, due to beef. It's like the easiest way to make a difference when in reality, it's not going to move the needle whatsoever. But in, to counter that, it still doesn't mean that the commercial or mainstream yep. agriculture for producing beef or cattle or any animal is, is right either it doesn't get a free pass and there's always room for improvement. And again, I think what you shared in the book regarding the Brazilian farmers showing in a two year period, how they reduced uh, the greenhouse gases of 20% as such uh, and improved the ecosystem and the environment as well. So. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's what you have to be open-minded, right? It's the, like, it's about being, doing beef better or doing, you know, agriculture better. It's not like, Oh, I'm just a carnivore and only eat beef or I'm just a vegan and only eat like plants. It's, it's about the system. So I actually hate diet wars. I know you do too, because well, it's like a giant distraction, right? It's, it's a religion. It's, 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 <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's just cult extreme and extremism. Uh, and yeah. it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense on a, like on a common sense perspective. And even if you think of the environment of how cows grow, they wouldn't survive without plants in the first place. Yep. And it's like, what's the easy, it's, it's, you just think about this, like simple, logically, all regenerative agriculture is, is just emulating nature in the best, you know, way it can. And that includes both plants and animals uh, moving frequently um, and having a biodiverse ecosystem. So you want to, and biodiverse is like a new keyword, but really it's just like, there's, tremendous diversity in life and most of that life is beneath the ground but in order to you know proliferate that life you need to treat the soil and the above ground animals the and the grass and the plants the correct way so yeah i mean it's it's such an exhausting thing to like see these diet wars and like you know carnivores vegans and everyone it's like that shit doesn't matter. What matters is that we need to fix the food system and we can fix the soil if we do that. And in turn, our health and yeah. just the uh, health of the planet. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm a big uh, seafood fan. So the, the, the soil and the ocean as well, the yeah. marine. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you actually <laughs> dived into this and, and actually understanding the marine, especially things like... Um, Malaska, uh, like oysters and how they are actually an Filter. amazing, yeah, but a carbon sink and mm -hmm. in, insane and even like seaweed and plankton as well. Um, but nonetheless, in terms <laughs> of like a um, biodiverse regenerative farm, when we're talking about beef, bison, goats, sheep, chicken, is, is there actually a framework or a model which is ideal with scaling or should we as a consumer be prioritizing eating bison instead of beef or obviously maybe limiting chicken or is, is there any like rules of thumb here? Yeah, I think this is like a really hot topic right now. I mean, Will Harris was on Joe Rogan and that's all he kept asking him. He's like, can this be scaled? Can this be scaled? Well, first off, you know, 
it has to be implemented because at this trajectory, we are going to have no soil that's healthy enough to even grow crops in 50 to 60 years time. So we have to start implementing these practices and it's really, it's not about scaling. Scaling can go two ways. It can go vertically or it can go horizontally, which is more of a replication at that, you know, piece. And that's what Will talks about too. And it's emulating these practices in a decentralized fashion. So that's context dependent, you know, to, for me, to be honest, yeah, bison probably would be better because they're a natural native ruminant to North America, but, and they're more resilient. So they, they need, le- you know, they're more resilient in the winter. They need less input, but they need more infrastructure because they're basically a wild animal that you need to make sure they don't, you know, move and leave your, your property. And then that's a whole ordeal. And the biggest thing is rotating them. So the rotation dynamics will be completely different. The framework at a high level is very similar is you should rotate your herd, you know, almost every day or every other day very frequently so that they eat down the grass. And then there's a long rest period. And, you know, it it could be a variance of, you know, one month, two months, it could be a year, or maybe your land is so, Um, depleted and there's so little nutrients that it may need multiple years i mean i just finished reading this really good book how uh for the love of soil i think it's called by i need to let you know that so you can post it but you know ranchers in montana were seeing that they needed to let their land rest for like three plus years because it just that's the condition of it and when the bison were around you know pre-1900 they would sometimes, you know, go through areas every year or sometimes every other year, every third year, it just depended. And there's these super long rest periods to allow that soil to recover and pull the nutrients and, and the grass to grow back health in a healthy manner. So, yeah, but they should be doing this with the monocrops as well, but obviously they just bulldoze that down. It's oh yeah. Just about, and it just destroys the system and then obviously you get floodings you get weather issues which is just very turbulent and it just like washes everything away so yeah. again this is this is when we get the yields of mineral composition in plant matter which is obviously dw- uh, dwindling and obviously changing the ph scale changing all this sort of network of uh, fungi and uh, bacteria and etc cetera, etc cetera, in the soil and um again the collateral effects is we as consumers, as the global population, is just going to get less nutrients at the end of the day. Uh, but again, also that com- comes at a cost with our own health. We are becoming more dysfunctional. Mm-hmm. And again, it, it's, it gets harder to lose adipose tissue. And obviously adipose tissue is an active organ and contributes to ill health. Uh, no way about it. So again, it's just like so hard to, to operate and be healthy now. Um, yeah, we're, we're facing an uphill battle. But I think, you know, that's, there needs to be more education on the, like the nutrient comparison is such a hard, like thing to show. I mean, the data yeah. is very all over the place, because it could be totally different. But like the water, you mentioned the resilience of, of land, you know, every, I think it's every percent of organic matter in the soil holds an additional 20,000 gallons of, of water per acre. So this yeah. is like, if you have an industrial system, you're not even able to Im- use half or more than 50% of the rainfall, depending on, you know, how hard it's raining uh, and everything. And it's like, it's just, you're just wasting that free natural resource. And 100%. then if you, if you look into um, the nutrients as a result of that, it's, it's just, uh, yeah, it's astounding. So I'm trying to do more of that nutritional comparisons as well. I think that can be really helpful to get people on the same page, but uh, yeah, the monocrop as well, pests, then you need more input. This, uh, this one researcher says, you know, pests love a monocrop because it's like a buffet of the same food that they love. But if you have, you know, multiple species of crops, like tens of species, then pests are not going to show up as much because they might like they one crop, but they yeah. can't, they won't eat any of the other ones. And then it's like this natural biodiverse defense. 
it, well, it sounds like humans as well. Like give them potatoes <laughs> or rice or pasta. Yeah. And just go chicken, for it. chicken, broccoli, rice every day. And, and if you give it like broadened choices, it's like, oh shit, like which one do I go for? There's more of a decision processing. But there could also be some anti nutrients that you work out to avoid or whatever it mm-hmm. is. And it might not be suited for your digestive capacity or your, your liver enzymes to detoxif- uh, detoxify appropriately. But I mean, yeah, I mean, your, your book is, like, again, it's also discussing Bitcoin. And again, I'm more in the health space. Again, I actually read your book, not for the health aspect, actually, although it was like, in, like for me, it was interesting to see the statistics and your, your train of thought there. But with the Bitcoin, I don't really know much about. And I do know people in the industry or in a space talking about Bitcoin. So what, I mean, I, and I would presume most of my audience or a large, and again, a larger majority of the public are still on the fence with Bitcoin. So could you just obviously, I, I wouldn't expect you to summarize it in two minutes, but where could people find out more, get more comfortable first with the idea of Bitcoin and then just, okay, like dip their toes in? Yeah, well, there's some there's some great education out there. Um, I would say the Bitcoin standard is is like the go to by Saifedean Moose. He also wrote a sequel called the Fiat Standard. But also my favorite book on the monetary system, which is a, a long one, is is called the the Creature of Jekyll Island, which talks about how you know the Federal Reserve came to be and everything. Um, but yeah, I just got off like a, a YouTube live as well an hour ago with Bitcoiners, and I talked about how all these interests are are paralleled, right? If you want to be in the driver's seat of your life, you need to take responsibility for your health, right? You make conscious decisions every day. You take ownership. You cook your meals. You talk to your local producers. You get your food. You're connected. Um, it's the same thing with Bitcoin. This is why there's such an overlap because Bitcoiners take responsibility and they self custody. They are their own bank and they're holding a form of money that has a limited supply and it cannot be altered. It has no CEO. It has no customer service. It's fully decentralized and they're taking that responsibility. And yeah, the price right now is, is, is down big in the last year. But if you have a low time preference, which is similar to health as well, you don't see overnight changes, but you're in this for the multi-year benefits You know, Bitcoin is the same way. If you have a low time preference, pretty much if you just hold it for three to four years, 100% of people have done that are, you know, in the positive. And the longer you hold it, the more return on that, you know, conviction you'll, you'll get. So there's just so much overlap in the principles of why people are attracted to these items. And obviously, they're the two most important things in our life. It's our health and our wealth. And they've both been robbed by centralized corporations and, and governments throughout the 20th and into the 21st century. Yeah, I mean, the statistics that you showed around fines on banks, was, <laughs> like, again, I had no idea about it. And it's like these, and even these uh, companies, drug companies, you, you, it's a drop in the ocean for them as well. And these are like, yep. for, for you and I, it's just like uh, big, big, big money. But for them, it's nothing. And, and what they're doing behind the scenes with playing with people's lives and their wealth, essentially. Yeah, I mean, just billion. And the whole banking system is, is like a Ponzi scheme, right? Every dollar that they hold, they can lend out $10. So, like, there, there was this giant crypto exchange that went down and, like, people are trying to run and take out their funds, but they, you know, it just went bankrupt and their money's gone. But banks, if if you try to pull out $500,000, if you had it in the bank, like tomorrow, they would be like, no, you, like, you can't do that, because we straight up don't have that. They do the same thing. It's just backed by the government. And yeah, you know, all their income comes from lending your money out 10 times over and fees, withdrawal fees, you know, trading fees, commission fees, yeah. overdraft fees, so it's just like a giant joke. And then they break the rules and get fined and they have all this money, just pay the fine anyway. And then, yeah, if you look at the lobbying and all, you know, who's paying the media and everything, it's, it's, it's so obvious that uh, everyone's in the same, same boat. But with the, it's still really not applicable day-to-day manner, is it? It hasn't really uh, transformed into, cool, I can just walk up and pay with my wallet. At, Bitcoin. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's what really, you know, the 
the economy on the day, day to day basis is that's a big thing that really needs to grow and user adoption. And, and that's like something that we're working on a lot. You know, I had an event yesterday in, in Austin with, with Brian Sanders food lies yeah. and, we, you know, half the people there knew no Bitcoin, half don't. And, you know, we had a chef cook up a great, you know, brisket and he didn't have a Bitcoin wallet. So my friend who is educating on, on Bitcoin, um, who runs an app that connects producers with consumers to pay only in Bitcoin via the Lightning Network, which Network. is kind of just a second layer on Bitcoin to make payments faster for the soft, the you know, software. smaller the so amounts. The software for the hard hardware. Sort of, yeah, but it's just like for for the day to day transactions. That's what's yeah. good for. And yeah, we all download this wallet, you know, and got you know he gave us like two dollars each in Bitcoin, and then we all sent that to the chef uh, as a tip. So right now, that's a big initiative is to start exchanging value for value. Like I started this direct to consumer bison. I'm selling bison now from Wyoming because I got connected with a rancher. It's it's been great, and half the people that I've sold to so far have, have paid me in Bitcoin um, because you know they just followed me and uh, they see the value in exchanging. And it's important, especially for like ranchers and farmers, because once they have that, like they can save in that, and it you know forces them to understand and, and use it. So that definitely needs to improve. But it's like a circular and local economy that that really it's important to to kind of educate on that level. So it's yeah. a work in progress, but it's uh, it's getting there. OK, is there I mean, we, we've been going for 40 minutes and I said we'll only be a 15 minute conversation. <laughs> I mean, that's just how it is. But like, um, is there anything that you want to leave uh, and s s final words, anything that you want to summarize? Yeah, I mean, definitely uh, check out my book. I think it's a great resource, um, Bitcoin and Beef, for you to convince others on why these topics are so important, um, to have factual firepower to defend your beliefs, and to understand the connection with you know food and financial systems. Because like I said before, there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of similarities. And uh, it comes down to the same principles. So if you're into health, most likely, maybe you'll start appreciating Bitcoin more. And then, yeah, it's just a movement that really is contagious. And if we get momentum and focus on the right things, such as, you know, fighting the centralized corporations and industrial systems instead of fighting diet wars and arguing over broccoli, then we might actually or, make some progress. Or, or, or how many calories are in bison. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Someone's so saying that's all dependent on the cut where it's from like who who knows and again this is this is the thing with calories and whatnot like you go on my fitness power chronometer you whack it in whatever it is the ounces and grams and again there's variation within like 20 percent of that yeah and again you're dying down the cut like the season the season <laughs> of where where that animal was slaughtered is going to be dependent and again it's just best guests yep. like Again, it's just even with nutrient density with food, and it really like pisses me off with this. Sure, eating nutrient dense foods is important, but again, you, it's not your whole life purpose to like chase nutrient density. It's actually laws of like conservation and retention and efficiency, which is all about health. It's not about chasing nutrient density and downing like raw liver all the time. Although it is important, it's not the be all and end all. It's about being uh, and operating freedom. And again, if you're, if you're so scared and living in fear around that nutrient density, you, you are not decentralized because again, you're still in a paradigm shift of being manipulated and feared around via marketers or, or people selling organ supplements as an example, when it's really not the case. Like, again, we, our ancestors never ate the amount of organs that people are prescribing or sharing. No way. They did cherish Yeah, them. I mean, I just shipped like, you know, hundreds of pounds of bison and there was probably 15 pounds of liver for four yeah, animals. That's so it's a, yeah, the, it's not, the it, ratio, what's that? The one? ratio. 4%? 4% yeah. of the Not even, animal. yeah, exactly. Exactly. And again, like, you have to understand this. And again, it, it just doesn't make sense. So something's I think going, yeah. In a time of, in a time of, where is this study or like, you know, prove this, that fact, fact check this. If you just think like, if you step back, think logically, 
you will be ahead of most people. And we just need to do that more often. You know, why does regenerative agriculture work? Because it emulates nature. And it's that simple. You should eat liver at the ratio it comes in nature. And yeah. are these things inherently bad for the environment? No, it's a natural system that has existed for thousands of years. Um, so the same thing with, with money, you know, is, is printing money like this sustainable? You know, does this actually work? No, of course not. So um, that and, you know, just take self-responsibility, accountability, stop trading your convenience for these things and uh, lower your time preference. Start thinking on multi, multi-year multi time frame and you will be astounded at, at what you can accomplish over a couple of years. 100%. Uh, great way to end the conversation. Tristan, thank you very much for your time. And again, I know you uh, just came on the back of another conversation as well. So you're, you're, you're probably f- a bit fried now. But, um, I'm ready for you- dinner. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, what are you having for dinner? More elk? Uh, some beef and a ham uh, I made. So, and some sweet potatoes, maybe something else. Yeah, it's uh, no elk. I've been eating so much elk. It's so good, but I take a break. <laughs> Yeah, I like to change it up as well with protein sources. Uh, just coming from Nicaragua, like beef is like the only real good thing I can get my hands on, and I'm just sick and tired yeah. of it. It's good. Yeah, it's diverse, diversify. You get more diverse nutrients and, you know, protein versus fat differentiations, all that. So 100%, 100% man. Well, thanks for having me. It's always You're good welcome. to chat. So again, it's Bitcoin and beef. The book is on Amazon. It's on Kindle. You can check out the article that Tristan um, done for the website, and that was on the newsletter as well. There's a there's a carousel on an Instagram post, and obviously follow Tristan for more information on on Bitcoin and on again the the word beef. And actually, funny enough, <laughs> this is just to end. I actually asked him why did he call it beef because again it's all about <laughs> eating the, like different animals. But again, obviously mm-hmm. it comes with the title Bitcoin and beef. It's Bitcoin and Animals doesn't really make sense. But, um, regenerative, regenerative systems, regenerative agriculture. Yeah, it doesn't really yeah. make sense. But Bitcoin and beef. <laughs> but again, uh, follow him for no, like, more nutritional wisdom. And he's just a good guy as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, follow, uh, for joining and following along and uh, sharing your comments. And see you soon. See you, mate. Thanks.